Welcome to the WT FFF Special Series, brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP, where your hosts, Tom and Tracy Hazard, explore the all about the what of 3D workflows from concept to print. Hey everyone, welcome to WTFFF. I'm Tracy Hazard and I'm here with Tom Hazard and we are excited to talk about something that we've actually mentioned, I don't know, thousands of times on the show? It's hundreds well, at least. We, we may have mentioned it thousands <laughs> of times because it would have been mentioned multiple times in many, many episodes. Many episodes, right. So. And I'm kind of a broken record about it because... You? Yeah, no. yeah, me. <laughs> um, because look and feel or color materials and finishes is my background, right? So it's always been the thing that bothered me the most about 3D printing is that it hadn't, there weren't, there weren't processes, there weren't techniques, there weren't finishes that could really bridge that gap between what we were creating on the machine and what would come out of it and be able to go into a consumer's hands. So the acceptance rate revolves around aesthetics a lot of times. Well, and I, I would say, Tracy, that really your biggest pet peeve about it is that, you know, designers who are creating parts to be 3D printed would just never consider the final finishes, or very often would, now, never is too strong a word, but very often would not even consider it. And so you get these parts that are just the color that comes out of the machine. Yeah. And that and then really isn't like, gonna work for consumers. Why don't people wanna buy it? Well, because it's yellow, you know, it's bright yellow, it's primary, you know, this is what bothers me. So we looked for many times post-processing techniques and other things like that, but there really wasn't, it was hard to investigate as an independent designer for sure. Um, and because, you know, you, you needed bigger machines, bigger equipment, sometimes you needed labs, sometimes you needed, you know, you needed research and experimentation. And so that's why I'm really glad we're bringing Wes Kramer on today. So um, from HP, Wes is a 3D application engineer there, and he uh, graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering and a minor in technology and management. Yeah, and the great thing about an applications engineer is he's working for HP assisting companies that are looking at buying one of their machines into how they can, you know, use different not only their machines, but different post processes to achieve the results that they need for their consumers before buying. That's one part of it. And then, then obviously there's some things for being done just for continued development with HP, which is fantastic. That's a tremendous resource. Yeah. So during Wes's time at, at HP, he's led several projects focusing on materials and post processing of the HP multi-jet fusion 3D printed parts. Today, a day, on a day-to-day -day basis, he assists future customers in developing new applications for 3D printing and existing customers with the tools they need for success to maybe they've got a part that's complicated, something they've never done before, looking at what those post-processing techniques and what their options might be. So he's already done a lot of the research for us, which is so great. So I, I'm so excited to pick Wes's brain. Well, let's get to it. And then I'm sure we'll have a lot to say after that. Hey, Wes, thanks so much for joining us today on WTFFF. You can hear our printer in the background today. Like, we're printing today. I don't know if they're going <laughs> to actually be able to hear it. They may not be able to, but, you know, typically we, because post-processing can be really cumbersome when you're dueling it on your own and you're, you know, you got a really small business or a really small design firm. And so it's sometimes so necessary. So I'm so excited that we're actually talking about that today because it's always been a big thing for me that our parts don't always look like we can make them in manufacturing. So why is this such a focus for HP? Yeah, definitely. So if you kind of look at HP's 3D printing technology versus some of the other ones out there, uh, what we've really done is position our technology for manufacturing and for production. And so when you think about that, you kind of think about end use parts, stuff that customers and consumers will have in their hands. And you think about kind of existing uh, plastic uh, products out there right now, there's a pretty high standard for look and feel aesthetics, you know, where the state of the technology is now with 3D printing. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of obstacles we need to overcome to get parts kind of to look and feel how the, the standard of injection molding looks right now. Um, and while kind of the, the technology of additive itself is developing, 
we kind of need a short term solution to help get parts to kind of adhere to that standard of injection molding now before before it kind of additive gets there eventually. So post processing is kind of like us bridging the gap between the kind of the, the preconceived notion of how plastic parts should look now with injection molding and uh, in, in where additive is. So it's how we kind of bridge that gap. You know, I find it always a little ironic that, you know, in injection molding of a part in particular, when you create that tooling, usually that part, the surface finish is very smooth. And usually you're adding texture back into it for, mm -hmm. you know, reasons, you know, of manufacturing uh, and part durability wear, all, all sorts of things. And, and with additive, we, we a lot of times have an inherent texture due to the process in a part that maybe we're trying to hide. <laughs> have you ever, right. mm -hmm. you know, have you found it that? It seems ironic, of, right? Right. Have you found that to be the case? Yeah, definitely. And I've seen some really cool situations where companies have kind of used the print what well, you call it a defect, but kind of, you know, the aesthetic qualities of 3D printed parts, they use it to their advantage. So you think about kind of layer lines. With, with our technology, you kind of have to put parts in specific orientations in the build in order to get them to be really visible. And some companies actually orientate their parts a specific way just so you can see them. So they, 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 they see it as kind of a benefit to them. Um, <laughs> kind of like you're, you know, kind of like when we used to layer woods for various things, and you wanted to, to get that that laminate look to go in one direction, and then you wanted exactly. it to go the other direction. So, yeah, you mm. could use it to your textural advantage, right? But Correct. that's hard yeah. to plan in. It's really hard to design. We found over time. Definitely, and so you kind of you you kind of want to be able to you know address whatever surface finish you want. So, you know, it kind of goes on both sides. Say you want a rough texture, you're already most of the way there with, with at least our technology, since it's powder based, it's already kind of gritty and sandy and look and feel, but you want to be able to offer the full range. And that includes that super smooth, super polished finish as well. And so you kind of want both of those and everywhere in between. Well, you know, that's, that's so interesting that you say that. So this has been one of my, my things about it is that the look and feel of the products from the day we started this podcast, but also from the day I, we first got our parts off the 3D printer, I was like, consumers aren't going to accept that. Like it, cause they right. get very custom, uh, accustomed to what they have. So while we can create and do our best to kind of get around it and I was frustrated by the pervasive attitude for the, you know, for quite a long time of the 3D print community in which they were, they were looking at it and saying, wow, you know, but look how great it is. People will forgive it because it's 3D printed. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, early adopters and fanatics who have 3D printing who just love it are more than willing to forgive the, the layer lines. But mm -hmm. consumer, general consumers, not so much, not when they have a choice. And right. so, you know, we do have to come into that. So let's talk a little bit about what those post-processing looks like and what some of the look and feels that we're trying to, to imitate. Right, definitely. What I've kind of broken it down into is, uh, you know, your, your look and feel. And so there's post-processing techniques that address things like color uniformity. There's post-processing techniques that can address issues like the, the surface quality. And so that's like the roughness of the part. And then there, there are some post-processing techniques that actually can enhance your properties, whether it be mechanical conform performance, conductivity, stuff like that. So if you kind of look in the realm of color uniformity, uh, probably the most common thing we've seen with our technology has been dyeing. Um, huh. And that's pro that's mostly because it's it's a really easy solution to implement and very scalable. It takes this kind of gray part that comes out of our machine, and in especially dark colors work really really well on it. Um, so you see a lot of customers kind of dye their their HP MJF parts black just to give it a nice overall consistent color. Um, so that's one of the most common we see there. Painting is also kind of common. Some of the issues I've seen with that have, have been kind of the flexibility of the paint itself. Um, sometimes if you don't have a paint coating that matches the flexibility of the part, it can be easy to kind of cause cracks and, and defects in the, in the actual layer of paint itself. 
Um, but what's cool about painting is you can kind of combine it with this priming step and get a nice thick primer base on there. And you can smooth that a little, little bit with sandpaper and you can get some really, really high quality surface finishes painting as well. So those are kind of some of your coloring. And then one of the pictures I provided you, this is Which probably- Which we'll be sharing on the blog post for this episode, right, everyone, right. so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a process called hydrographics. Um, and it's probably one of my favorite coloring techniques. And the way it works, and this is a technology that's been around a long time. It's in a lot of consumer products now. It's been used in automotive, eyewear, a bunch of different industries. Furniture, the we've done it before. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can do it on your own too. I've, I've seen kits on Amazon that you can buy and you can do it at home. Super cool. So just like painting, you kind of apply this base coat or primer to your part. Just kind of get the, the, the a nice base there. And then the way the process works is you have this magical film that's that has this this 2D texture or pattern on there, whatever you want. A lot of people use camo. Um, that's a pretty common example. You know, you can have flames. You, anything that you can print in, in 2D, you can have as a as kind of your pattern. Um, and you put it in on the surface of this big tub of water and then you spray this activator on top of it. And what that does is it actually separates the ink on that film from the film itself or it dissolves the film. And then what you do is you slowly dip your part in to that tub of water with the film in there and then you pull it out and that film is then uh, whatever pattern was on there is applied to your part. Um, I know it does look it does look a little bit like magic I, I love that absolutely yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so and it's fun because I'm a I'm a textile designer so I have that 2d background and so it's always been fun for me to do that but you know we don't always want patterns on everything that we do so you've got to have those True. other alternatives like the color you know the solid coloring well but I would like to say something in favor of the the <laughs> Hydro, what did you call hydrographics. it? Hydrographics. Hydrographics. Hydrographics, yeah, hydro dipping, I've right. heard different names. I'm, yeah, and I, I've been aware of it for a decade probably myself. And one of the things that I find that's wonderful about that process is that especially if you take a, a textural looking pattern, like let's say the look of carbon fiber or something that's woven, it really transforms a part and when you're looking at that finished part in context in whatever product it's a part of you would never know that that part was 3d printed yeah right and we use that typically in furniture and other places for that same purpose right so we want to hire uh, we want to hide a, a you know a uh, inferior grade of wood or something like that right. that doesn't have beautiful, you know, uh, patterning on it or um, grain. So we, we do that all the time to lower the cost of a product. And, and that's where we ended up using that as well. So in this case, you're using it for the same purposes. The one question I want to ask you about is though on the, on the color side of things, because it's, it's been really an important part of my complaints about what's going on and you know, what, color brilliance doesn't always come across in dyeing. And it's partially because you have slightly gray matter. It's not pure white that you're starting mm -hmm. from. So you're getting that muddiness to the color. So we created almost an, an uh, you know, a difficulty in getting those brilliant colors that people normally expect from our products. Um, right. Is there, has there been some developments or are there stuff in the works maybe that are going to help to, to fix that and adjust for that? So probably, at least when it comes to HP's technology, one thing that has kind of improved our dyeability with different colors is our new 580 platform um, and, and the 540. So, so those two machines, they're smaller than our production platforms. Um, and they actually print, one of them prints parts in full color, which is really cool by itself. But both of them, if you don't apply color to the parts, they print them in monochrome. So if you think of like an SLS type type part, it kind of resembles that a little bit. You have a nice kind of bright white background already. And then if you take that part and you dye it, then you can achieve those really brilliant bright colors. Mm, um, so that's, so that's, really that's, helpful. that's the, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I've seen people do things like you know, sandblasting their parts and doing other things to get a better surface to begin with. Is that still common or, you know, is that's harder to do? 
Right. So sandblasting is actually a crucial step in our process and any powder based process. Um, and that's because after, you know, the fusing process in the, in the printer itself, you're going to have all of this powder on the surfaces that that's still kind of attached. And so, you know, anyone who buys one of our machines, it's expected that they're also going to have some sort of bead or sandblaster that's going to be able to take the excess powder that wasn't fused to the part off of the part. You know, aside from just kind of using it as a means to clean the part, uh, you can put different media in there. One example is this graphite media that's pretty commonly used. And so if you think of pencil lead shavings, if you just kind of shave pencil lead over and over again into a big tub and you mix that with your blasting media, it, that provides a really nice, cool, uniform finish on the surface of parts as well. Nice. And, and what's cool about it is it doesn't add any extra processing time um, because you combine it with that, that sandblasting or bead blasting step. And it, yeah, it, it's, it's already done. It's already included for you. The only problem with that or caveat with that process is you're going to have this surface of the part and, and if you were to rub you know your hands on it over and over again and you were to look at your hands you would have graphite all over them. <laughs> that's um, not a good idea right <laughs> yeah exactly so it's it's good for kind of some maybe demo parts where people will just be looking at them and you kind of want a nice consistent look and feel that way uh, but if it's going to be an end use product that people are going to touch a lot um, it might not be a good option. And another good case where it might be useful is in, you know, 3D printed gears or something where you kind of want this lubrication mm -hmm. effect that that powder graphite actually provides that. So it's kind of it's interesting. Useless. That, that would make a lot of sense because I know they use graphite as a lubricant a lot of the times now. And, and it's very different from oil, which attracts dirt and dust and graphite doesn't really do that. I have a, a follow-up question to when you were talking about the I think it was 540 or 580 machine, one of those mm -hmm. that you said prints in colors. Yeah. Um, so you still would clean those parts up with the sandblaster as well after yeah. they come out. But is that color throughout the solid part or is it only go so deep? Do you have a danger of sandblasting through the color? Yeah. So the way that technology works is is super impressive, at least in my opinion. Because the way our, our process works is you have this black fusing agent normally, and that absorbs this visible light spectrum. And that's how you get your thermal energy to actually fuse the layers together. But what we've developed is what we call this light fusing agent. And it actually is able to absorb energy from the ultraviolet or infrared um, spectrum. And that's how you absorb the color. So it doesn't have to be black. It's actually this really white clear fusing agent and that so that's something that's really unique that we've been able to develop and it's super cool to see used but basically the the inside of the part is still that black fusing agent so if you were to cut one of our color parts you know in half you would see that black on the inside but on the outside we use that light fusing agent um, in combination with the different colors and, and pigments um, and so you do see and and you don't quote me on the on the thickness of this but you would see you know on that outer shell you know, maybe, you know, 0.3 millimeters or something thickness of color. So, so definitely if you have it in a bead blaster for too long, or if you get too close to it, if you kind of overdo it, you will get that color um, kind of to come off there and you will be able to see the, the black underneath. So, so it is kind of a little bit differently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely a little bit more care and attention with those parts. What about but, something you know, like vapor smoothing? Like how does that work? Right. So vapor smoothing, if you kind of look now, you know, aside from color at more of the, the feel of a part and, and the surface quality, the way that vapor smoothing works is, you know, if you think about, I think, what is it, acetone that they use on PLA and ABS, ABS parts? It's, I think it's a kind of a similar process to that. We're using chemicals and kind of this vapor form in this chamber to kind of almost get the surface of the part to flow, to melt it almost a little bit. Um, and so what that does is it takes this then grainy surface, it kind of gets it to flow and it smooths it out that way. Um, and, and with that too, you know, you have to get the parameters just right. So you don't, you know, overdo it, but you also do it enough where you actually see a visible difference. So that's a tricky thing as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. I've actually tried that process myself on some other parts. And I think it is, it is tricky. You really have to have some good equipment, the right environment to do it and a good process that's pretty controlled. I personally like the idea of the sandblasting to clean up a part like that, um, get that excess stuff off. And I would think, you know, to return to that for just a brief moment is, you know, you really wouldn't want to blast it so long to go through the color because then you're dimensionally changing the part too much anyway, right? <laughs> right you have to you be know, careful of that you too, right? Blast it just enough to clean it up, but that's about it, right? And right. I think it's the same with vapor smoothing. You want to do it just enough to right. smooth that finish without melting it. And well, I think I've melted my fair share of parts. You're pointing out something that it. we learned a long time ago, which is for everything, you always have to, you, you can't design your product, right? You can't design your whole thing and not understand how you're going to post-process it. So for us, we always right. had to consider paint tolerances or vinyl wrapping or whatever it was that we were doing, though, that was always a tolerance. You had to consider in how you design the product to begin with so that you create extra <laughs> tolerance for that or create the make sure that the ability you have to create it extra thick so that if you do have to in order to create the texture that you need have to go down a certain distance you can do that as well right so. yeah definitely those critical dimensions that you really have to keep an eye out for i mean what's nice is you can always kind of add you know machining or something as a, as a kind of a post process and you know a way to get the exactly how you need um, but you're right, you know, with some post processes, you're either adding material or you're taking some of the material away. And so you definitely have to be cognizant of that and dial in your process so that you achieve the same results every time. You, you mentioned something earlier that I want to come back to that just seems so interesting that the idea of enhancing performance, so mechanical mm -hmm. performance, enhancing performance through some, uh, through plating or other types of techniques. Talk a little bit about why you would want to do that and what you guys are, are investigating. Yeah, definitely. You know, there's, there's a lot of different post processes that kind of do this in different ways. You know, vapor smoothing is one of them. If you, you know, if you think about that with, you know, water fastness and kind of reducing the porosity on the surface of a part, you know, that's something that tremendously helps. But, you know, the one that really comes to mind here for enhancing performance is definitely electroplating. And the reason why it does so much is because you're kind of, you know, taking that strength of the part and you're, you're putting this much stronger metal on the surface of it, whether it's copper or nickel or some other, some other metal. And now that part takes on the property of that, that electroplated coating or surface. And so, you know, by doing that, you can make parts much, much stiffer. You can make them electrically conductive. You can make them more resistant to high temperatures. There's a lot you can do there. And if you think about, you know, light weighting structural applications where you have, you know, some generative design or topology optimized design or a lattice, you combine that with electroplating where you get this super stiff, stiff structure that's also super lightweight. I mean, that's that's money right there. You know, that's that's everything that you look for and hope. For. So it's really cool to kind of play around with that and get some samples, you know. To see really what's possible there. Now I, I'm kind of a, I kind of want to have a shop, Tom. Like <laughs> I know, like all these all these new techniques and and you know to get surface materials and surface color again. I want to play. Mm -hmm. Well, don't, don't get me started. <laughs> I know, You're seriously, gonna we're going to be in such trouble. The budget. Yeah. <laughs> um, electroplating. Did you use that process when you're working on that Porsche hub? Yeah, uh-huh. Um, and, you know, it's really, really tricky to take an additive part and get it smooth enough to where you have that mirror-like finish. But, you know, with just a lot of time doing some manual sanding, it's definitely possible. And, you know, being able to look and, and touch those parts in real life, it's it's really cool. I mean, so that's, for those that's of you who didn't listen to the episode, I just want to say, so we yeah. did an episode with Dylan Patel, and we were talking about uh, reverse engineering, and one of the examples he was using was this Porsche Hub, which is you know and. It, a custom part, right? So it's you know it's hard to well, find. Well, so it's, it's a replacement, replacement part, part, really, that it doesn't exist anymore. Isn't that right? Right. Yeah. And so, you need to well, match we, it perfectly, mm -hmm. right? So or try to or try to. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we exactly hit the mark in terms of you know matching the the hues on it, and you know it's 
it's not like every metal surface is the same. You know, you, you have bluishness and I, I'm not using the technical terms there, but it is kind of hard to, uh, to, to get it right on your first try. And so that's kind of what Dylan was showing. There was our first or our second try and we were kind of getting as close as possible to the original. Well, the, Even if it's not an exact is, is match. Wheels are far enough apart. People will think it was in the shade. You'll be well, fine. I probably, <laughs> if it were my car, I probably would have made a set of four so that they all match <laughs> with right. the new process. Right? Yeah, that's that's actually what we did. Um, <laughs> and so when I say it didn't really match, I think I'm more referring to the the original part, which was kind of decayed and, and was peeling and some of the color might have been lost that way anyways they at the end we did have a set of four and they all did match very well oh good um, this happens yeah. a lot when we try to match in vintage parts of any kind like the color actually may have changed over time so what you're getting isn't the original i've seen that happen where they will get by find out what the original paint was or the original finish was buy it and then it doesn't match anymore and they're frustrated right. by it but it's because <laughs> it, it it didn't age well it you know it got deteriorated by the sun or something happened and that actually altered the color um so yeah so right. it's much better idea to, to do all four like you guys did so yeah so i love that now you know one of the other issues that we we always encountered so it wasn't just you know the idea of post-processing holding it back but also sometimes post-processing means putting parts together so sub-assembly or or other things like that are there better ways to attach parts today and so that's definitely that's definitely something we've put a lot of time and effort into studying is kind of what are some of the best joining techniques because you know every additive technology has a limit on how big it can be so if you want to make big parts say like a, a car bumper that's all 3d printed you're going to have to join several parts together i mean that's actually what we did with one of our studies is we set out to make a car bumper and that requires a whole set of post-processing techniques in order to get that perfected. But definitely the critical one there is how you join parts. And so, you know, there's, there's different classifications of part joining, but kind of two of the big subgroups would be adhesives. So, you know, just kind of gluing stuff together um, and then also kind of welding and that's kind of melting the two pieces together with different techniques. Uh, so on the gluing side, there's a lot of different adhesives out there that kind of are on a range of, you know, stiffness. You know, you can have really strong, really stiff uh, adhesives, but that might not necessarily match what the material is doing. And what you want is kind of maybe more of a flexible material for certain certain instances. So interesting. So, You've got like, yeah. Yeah, got so many choices to make here. <laughs> Definitely. It, it's never quite as simple as, as you kind of initially think, you know, there's always a lot of factors at play. So there's, there's the material itself that you use as the adhesive, but there's also the joint design too. There's so many different ways you can get parts to overlap and join together. Um, so it's really important to understand what are some of the design constraints? What are some kind of tips and tricks on the design side that get a, a strong union that that's not going to break and then you kind of get into the engineering side you have to look out for stuff like stress concentrators things that are going to cause kind of cleavage or kind of some sort of separation of the parts that way so you have to get clever about that so the one thing that i was thinking is like do you have you know when you approach a part so you you, you know you say i'm creating this part or i've got this design you know, is there, are there some kind of analysis process that you go through to say, I think we're going to need this. I think we're going to need that. Where should we start to experiment? Do you have some kind of, you know, like process of elimination of like, no, that won't work <laughs> in your mind? Are you, are you referring to any post process or still part joining? Uh, either. Yeah. I mean, any post process would be my, my thing. So you've got a design and you see it in the computer and you're just looking at that going, okay, here's what we're going to need to achieve our goals. Do you have things that you just like really are easy to eliminate quickly saying, that's not going to work yeah it, it, it is just so dependent on what they're trying to get out of the part you know if it's if it's a purely aesthetic part and it's not going to undergo a whole lot of you know mechanical stress you know and it's it's fairly rigid and they just want a nice uniform surface on it then you might be looking at painting right you know that's a really easy solution that's that's already implemented in so many cases and it's going to be probably pretty easy to implement for them there but say it's kind of more of a structural part that's going to bend a lot, it's going to go under a lot of loads, and maybe the strength of the part isn't 
strong enough by itself. So you might need to go to something like electroplating to get it stiffer. You might have to improve it that way. It's 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 so dependent on what what they're trying to get out of the part. What's almost easier is just kind of you know talking with the customer, saying you know what's important to you here, um, and then just kind of you know, going from there. So interesting, thinking more about the end use and the end purpose of this particular part where it might be different though at the stage of development you're in too. So you might be creating a prototype that is for a particular purpose, trade show or something like that versus how you actually might do it when you go to create the end product eventually. So right. you might actually be doing it differently each time. Well, Wes, you talked earlier in the interview about, you know, end use parts. Uh, which I think is fantastic. I mean, we've always been very big supporters of the idea of making end use parts with 3D printing, you know, from I think our earliest days of WTF. Yeah, I mean, right? this is our goal was because because we were small and, you know, if you're a small manufacturer or small design firm or whatever, you want to touch the part as little as possible. So you wanted to basically come off the machine, be ready to go. Like we didn't even want right. to, you know, scrape off anything. <laughs> we just <laughs> Right, but but plating is a wonderful process that, you know, when you electroplate something, it it really transforms it. I mean, you you really won't know what material was underneath it. Um, so I'm just curious, how many application? Well, or maybe you could just say percentage wise, what are you experiencing with potential customers looking at buying HP products or looking to do end use parts versus you know something that isn't intended to be an end use part? Um, and I, I I don't know if I can give you specific numbers on this, but I will say is that you know. I think if you look at, you know, what the whole history of additive will be, I think we're at the very beginning of, of end use parts being produced. Wonderful. Um, so I think right now where we're kind of at is we're kind of starting out with kind of parts that are a little bit lower requirements and maybe won't be in customers hands, but you're going to find them in factories. You're going to find jigs and fixtures and stuff that maybe a customer is not going to use, but it's going to be used in the process that makes the parts are going to be used kind of you know going for that low-hanging fruit first and then kind of as the technology improves and develops and you also improve these these post-processing techniques you get them more and more scalable then kind of see more and more end-use stuff but if you think about some specific end-use applications um, eyewear is a good one we see several companies using our technology today to use custom to to make custom eyewear and you see it like like making eyewear for kids because you know they grow and their faces grow and you're gonna have to get new ones all the time and also they break them a lot. So kind of figuring out a good you know low cost solution for those. Um, another good solution is in prosthetics and in um, orthotics. Uh, a lot of end use products we see now or are insoles for your for your shoes um, that are kind of custom tailored to your biometrics. Uh, you know, th there's a lot out there and I think it's only going to grow and it's going to grow exponentially. Yeah. Well, I would tend to agree with you. I, I believe that. And, and that's always, that's been my hope for the yeah. industry. I just, I'm hoping we, we see a lot more of it sooner and I get to play with it, you know, still in my time on this earth. That's know? right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, I would love for you to, before we go, to give um, some advice to those out there doing the design and engineering work. You know, uh, what should they consider ahead of time? What are some uh, things that they might want to think about as they're designing and engineering their products so that they can adjust for post-processing or, or account for it ahead of time? Right. I, you really do need to think about the product in, in every stage of its life. You need to think about, you know, how it's going to be manufactured. You know, what quantities are you going to be working with? Uh, what volumes? And, and so having a process that's suitable for that, because, you know, you're not, if you are producing 10,000 of these parts a year and you have really, you know, high requirements for the smoothness on it, you're not going to be able to just manually sand everything, you know, yeah. you're going to have to come up with a solution that's scalable with the volumes you're producing. So thinking about it from that all the way to when it's being used by the consumer, you know, how is it going to interact with them? You know, what's going to be a long lasting durable solution that's going to hold up to things like UV, you know, the, the, the mechanical stress that's going to be applied on it. 
And then lastly, what's going to even happen to it after it's used once it's disposed? Is this going to be something that can be recycled? Is it something you know, that's going into a landfill and it's going to be terrible for the environment? You have to kind of take all of those into account um, in order to kind of come up with the ideal solution that's you know, not going to cost the manufacturer too much money to produce. I mean, it's also going to deliver on all the things um, they're looking for on the customer side. Well, and I also think over time, like, you know, you're talking about that we're at the tipping point of it. I mean, over time, we can get to also a new aesthetic. So, you know, we're seeing right now Tesla's with a matte finish. Like, and so right. we've never seen automotive with a matte finish. So matte finish is going to start to come into our normal acceptance for consumer products. So I think that there are going to be shifts just overall in the consumer market in general that are going to benefit the types of things that we can do and the ways that we want to treat it. And so that we don't always have to simulate something that was right. done before, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. It can become its own new thing, but it has to become unique and beautiful and, and have a great look and feel that is, um, that the user gets attached to. I think you're right. Uh, you know, it's definitely nice to think about the bar kind of being lowered a little bit and maybe <laughs> public perception kind of, you know, transforming more towards, you know, the matte finish and stuff that's already closer to what additive is doing now. But you, you really can't sit around and wait for that to happen. No. I mean, you definitely need to be proactive and, you know, what the consumers want today. You have to start coming up with solutions for that because, you know, those, those sociological factors are always going to change and you want to have a nice robust solution that's going to be applicable for all of them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I loved what you yeah. said at the very beginning, talking about it post-processing as being a bridge. And I, that's what mm -hmm. we agree to. You, you have to bridge that gap for, for those that aren't ready to just accept it. Uh, you know, they're not the fanatics and, and fans of it already. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, Wes, I thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. And we love this in-depth talk into a, a topic we've mentioned again and again on the show. So, Well, it's nice to talk to an expert and somebody yeah. who is, you know, pioneering for HP and HP customers what these, you know, total end-to-end -end applications and processes and workflows, you know, are going to be that'll, that'll produce results that they need. So that, that's great. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Well, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And, you know, a few things have occurred to me, you know, even just after that interview ended. And it, it's, again, is a little bit of a it, – it takes a different way of thinking about designing parts to end up with the kind of texture and finish you want. And – as he's talking about electroplating, I was thinking, hmm, I wonder, you know, there's so many different metal surface finishes that get done at, a, at the very end of the process after even electroplating, where he was talking about trying to get parts as smooth as they can be to be very glossy so that plating is very clean looking. And that's certainly one approach. But I wonder, you know, there are parts that are, have a brushed metal look then that brushing gets done last, the end process, or a hammered metal look that also might be done last. Right. You could actually put those kind of textures into the plastic part, 3D print it, then plate it, and then- Let them transfer through? Transfer through, right. And it probably would, and it's something that has to be experimented with more, but it probably would hide much more of that gritty powder, uh, I guess I would say telltale sign that it's a 3D printed powder bed. But part. at the same time, that that gets to something that I was kind of mentioning towards the end of the interview is that now it's creating a new aesthetic, a new style that had never that hasn't been done before that couldn't be created in the old manner of hammering and doing those brushing and things in post processing. Well, you're very right about that, Tracy. And you know, it's interesting because. Right now, as 3D printing is the new manufacturing technology and, and really has been for a couple decades, even more now, throughout history of manufacturing materials, there have always been what you call them limitations, call them characteristics or side effects of different materials and different machinery that processes those materials produces a certain look. And sometimes we're trying to copy the service quality appearance or otherwise of 
a material made by a part that's very old technology. And the only reason that it had that look is because it was a limitation of the machine at that time. <laughs> right. So it really does make sense that there is going to be an acceptable consumer aesthetic that's a result of 3D printing technologies. Now, it may take a lot longer before that's actually revered as, oh, that's a look I really want. Right. But, but you know, thinking about that, so I was thinking about this earlier when he was talking, and it was like, we spent a lot of our career putting pictures of wood on pictures of wood. So we put veneers on what was MDF or other, which is like a wood composite at the end of the day, right? And so, you're, you know, you're, you're talking about doing that. And in some cases, we also always put, you know, textures of plastic onto plastic. And so this isn't a new thing, like injection molding and other types of molding, uh, rotational molding, some of these other, other techniques that we were using had lines of where the manufacturing was or where the material went in, where sprues came off, right? And we were always trying to disguise that by creating texture on it. So it really isn't different. So we as a designers and engineers, we need to approach it from that same perspective that this is just the constraints of the way that the machines work. And we need to design something that is going to be acceptable to the consumer and bridge that gap for them, that they're not going to look at that and go, that seems like a defect, right? That's oh, the idea. Absolutely. And, and I think 3D printing affords some new opportunities there where Injection molding, you would always create the mold, it's smooth, and then, oh, what kind of texture do you want on the part? And there are libraries, and all of you, you know, mold engineers know this, I'm sure a lot of industrial designers out there know this, but there are libraries of different plastic textures that exist, of different styles and, you know, different scales, and you actually can choose a certain texture, you know, number identifier and, and a tool maker after the tool is done will apply that texture to it. And there are processes for that. But you could actually choose a texture you want and apply that to your 3D model and then actually print the texture. And then if you dye that part with a certain solid color dye, that may be all you, you know, after the little sandblasting process that Wes was talking about, that may be all you need to do. And it looks like it came out of a mold mm -hmm. and is all intentional and not just circumstantial. Right. Absolutely. You know, I, we're more than halfway through the series with HP and um, here, and I have learned a tremendous amount. But one of the things that really impresses me, and this is, goes back to my days as a color material finish manager at Herman Miller. So they, we called it CMF, color materials and finishes. But whether you're a post-processing engineer or a CMF manager, like whatever that is, the fact that these companies at that kind of quality and level, like HP is doing here, has a team that can be so narrowly focused on this what they're doing is creating a future ecosystem. They're accelerating that opportunity for success for those of us who want to go into manufacturing, want to be a full design service agency, engineering company, whatever that is. They're accelerating the, the learning process, the research, all of those things through that because they can have someone like Wes Kramer on to be able to work on this particular niche area for us. It's really a valuable resource and a tremendous benefit of working with a company like HP and, yeah. and it goes beyond HP because I think as we said in, in an earlier episode that this is going to benefit the entire industry. Right. But you know, what's so funny, Tom is like, it just, you know, this is an example. We, we tried to, uh, tumble parts like oh, and, yeah we, did. we bought like one of those jewelry tumblers on amazon a, it was a barrel finish you know yeah uh, and you tool. know but we didn't know what to put in it or what to try if we had tried we graphite it might have been cool right wow. but we had no idea we had nothing to go on there was no research no information of course this is like six years ago or five years ago and so you know having at least a build of knowledge to then be able to add on your own specific what to it, right? As we always talk about here on WTF, about the what part is the important part. So what your end use is, what your end goal is, what its purpose is, and now being able to take some of this knowledge base and then adding that, adding your own uniqueness to it, the thing about you that you want to bring to it, it's thing, the uniqueness that you want to bring to your product. That's going to be so valuable that you just can step on the shoulders of all these, all this great research and all this great information for you. So I hope you enjoyed today as much as I did. I really enjoyed it. I did too. It, it was a lot of fun to talk with Wes to learn what they're doing there. And I'm, I continue to be excited about how the industry is progressing. 
Yeah, maybe we will get to our place of perfect and used products coming right off the machine someday. I hope so. <laughs> well, all of you listening, thank you so much. Don't forget that you can get all of the links, the images that Wes provided for us. Um, you can get the link back to the uh, episode where we referred to the Porsche Hub as well. So you can get a link back to that as well. Everything's going to be in the blog post for this episode at 3dstartpoint.com. And if you would like to get any information about this whole HP series and just understand all of the pieces and parts that are part of this series, you can go to 3dstartpoint.com forward slash HP. Thanks everyone for listening. I'm Tracy Hazard. And I'm Tom Hazard and you've been listening to WTFFF. Thanks for listening to the WTFFF special series brought to you by the Z and 3D print teams from HP. You can access all the resources mentioned in this episode and all the other episodes in this series by going to 3dstartpoint.com slash HP. We invite you to reach out to us on social at 3D Startpoint and at Z by HP and let us know what you are creating in 3D.